heart. Welcome everybody to the solo of the month group practice. Uh, my name is Matthew Allison with the Flute World Collective. And this month, which is July of 2023, we're going to be looking at the Demersman Air of Arrier and the J.S. Bach Partita, um, the last two movements. Uh, you all might have noticed, or some of you may have noticed that I've been doing some interviews of some high profile people this month, uh, including Patricia George and Keith Underwood, and those being recognized at the National Flute Association's conventions as the um, 2023 Lifetime Achievement Awards. And I've been, I don't know, I guess, learning and listening to some really interesting tidbits from them. And without having taken lessons from them, I've been kind of interpreting it in my own way. So from those interviews, I have made up my like warm up of the month, which is a one handed warm up for tone and embouchure flexibility. And I'd like to go through that with you all today. It'll take, I don't know, five or six minutes if we don't uh, stress about it too much. Uh, for the one handed warm up, it's a lot easier to balance the flute if you take your foot joint off. And the reason we're doing this one-handed warm-up is to really gain a great relationship of our face and the flute and how much we need to move our face and how much we don't and when and where and why, et cetera. So I'm gonna take my right hand. Um, if you need help with left and right hand, you might remember the L and not L, right? Um, my right hand and grab the barrel. So that way my fingers can still play, my left hand can still play the left hand fingerings. And I'm going to start with a G fingering, which is the lowest of those one-handed fingerings. Using my right hand for support, bring the flute to my face and I find, and the cool thing about this too is you'll hear Patricia George talk about like the pizza wedge shape or whatever that we want with the flute angles. So having the right hand here automatically opens up that right side of the body a little bit too. So you don't need to like pull it back all tight and scrunch, just let it be open and free. So if, let's work on finding a very centered and resonant low G. Original sound for musicians on, so low G. Now, if my tone and pitch isn't centered on that G, I would stick with just doing that. But when my tone and pitch are centered, I'm gonna work on embouchure flexibility. So I'll start with that G centered in tune, and then I'm gonna bend the pitch down holding the flute stable, so my flute's not gonna roll in or out, my head's not gonna go up and down, but I'm gonna bend the pitch down by moving my face down. I'll then come back to normal, then bend the pitch up by moving my, I don't know, face back and bottom jaw slightly forward. I don't talk about jaw movements too much because I don't want TMG, TMJ pain, but like I'm thinking yo and woo, yo, woo, when I think this. So my pitch bend down will be here in the lips, normal, pitch bend up. So without dropping my head or rolling my flutes, let me find center again. And then pitch bend up. And then finding that center. And sorry, my horse is drinking his water behind me. Um, I have a hundred pound golden doodle and he always gets thirsty right when I'm doing a Zoom call, it seems. So try that on the G again. Staying just with the center G, if that's where we are. Or the pitch bends. Yep, we'll take it up to an A flat and do the same thing. Center pitch. Bend down, bend up. And then as I taper away, my face is going to move into the pitch bend up shape. So when I combine it in the ah, ah, ee, ah, is kind of what I'm thinking to keep my decrescendo and my release from going flat. Let's try it on an A. Center pitch. Good. 
B flat. We'll have to use the thumb B flat here. And pitch bend. B. C. And then every flute player's favorite note, we may as well make it part of our daily warm-up when we're considering pitch C sharp, which will just be the right hand. Sometimes I leave the left hand on the crook. Sometimes I go ahead and grab over at the crown. Now, everyone just take a minute and kind of play around with that. This isn't to say that I never move my head for intonation. This isn't to say that I never roll in or out for intonation. I just don't want to be dependent on it or rely on it. So take a second and play around with it. And then I want to just have a discussion of what it felt like to do that. And you, if you've already had some fun with it, maybe go ahead and unmute yourself and tell me what you're, what you're feeling or thinking so far with trying just that part of the warm up. Patricia George indicated that Michelle DeBost started every warm up one handed, brought the flute to his face like this, found where he wanted on his face, then played. Uh, I think maybe Thomas Nightinger did also. Um, I'm I'm re I'm having trouble remembering some of the uh, names that were used in the interviews and and stuff like that. But hey, if amazing names like that can do it, then so can we, right? All right, anybody have any thoughts or feelings of what, what that feels like to warm up the low register like that? How is the stability of your tone? I still have an issue with pitch bending down. I'm just having a hard time with it. I had to, I had to quit because I was getting frustrated. <laughs> I can pitch bend up just fine, but I don't know if it's just the flexibility. I can't get my lips down or whatever, but I'm having a hard time with that. Yeah. I got to work more on that. Frustration is something that happens, especially in practice, and especially for those of us who really want to do it right or do it well. Um, let it be about exploration. So if you know that you can pitch bend up easily, then maybe adjust your head joint accordingly, meaning you might pull your head joint out a little bit um, and then stay in a slightly more pitch bendy up shape so that way you have flexibility to bend down when you need to. Bending down isn't as necessary of a skill for a lot of the music that we're playing today as bending up will be. Bending up is important for every note that we release, the end of every taper, every day crescendo, right? Pitch bending down, upper register tends to go sharp. We'll want to pitch bend down there. And if we're making like an extreme crescendo, um, the Bach and the Demersmann don't go super high. So um, the pitch bending up, so lucky you, Chris, that you're able to pitch bend up. Pitch bending up for me is actually much, much harder than pitch bending down is. So, do, 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 changing the amount of real estate in your mouth cavity can help bend up and down. Thank you, Ellen. Yes, I need to figure out how to show this chat too. There we go. Um, awesome. So from there, I focused my movement of face mostly on pitch. I'm going to go back to one-handed flute playing to that G fingering and move into some octave slurs. On the octave slurs, I'm going to try to have both octaves in tune and I'm gonna to try to do as little movement with my face as possible. Do I sometimes do intervals with my face? Yes, of course. But if I can learn to do more of it with controlling the air within my system, then I can reserve more of that movement for intonation. And let's face it, intonation is very, very hard on flute, right? So if, I, if my face is for intonation and dynamics and, and intervals are done somewhere else, then I have more ability to control intonation and, and dynamics. And uh, I guess all of us, I think, have some amount of trauma uh, in our flute playing lives. And 
uh, when I was uh, 19, I was told, the one thing that's going to keep you from having a successful career in music is you have no sense of pitch and your intonation is awful. And that stuck with me ever since. And I've been up, well, actually, no, my ego back when I was 19 was like, whatever, I'm really good. Um, and then, you know, when I was in grad school, I was like, oh, wait, my intonation actually isn't very good. I should probably start thinking about this. So it's something that I think about now that I'm old or than that. All right, so let's try that G. Original sound for musicians back on. And I'm just gonna go back and forth between the octaves. Those of you who have practiced octave smears or octave um, drawn octaves with me, I'm feeling that kind of shape in my mouth. And if you don't know what octave smears or drawn octaves are, we can talk about that later. Speaking of me and my, uh, 20, when I was 20, there's actually videos of me teaching octave drawn octaves and octave smears when I was like 22. So when YouTube was first coming around. I might go very slow for pitch and then speed it up just to feel the air pressure changing. And I feel a little bit of movement of this part of my throat to control it and this soft palate, which I don't actually know how to move the soft palate, but I know it's moving. Uh, same on A flat. And for most, the descending octave tends to be flat. We're used to backing off our air pressure a whole lot when we do that descending leap, that it tends to be quite flat. And if you're playing the bourree in the Bach, you might notice between measure two and three, there is an octave descending leap, right? So we're warming up this way because it's going to be useful for what we're about to play. And it's just good. A fingering. You can do it with your thumb B flat. All of that's a little sharp for me, so I'm going to do it again. B natural. C. And our love. C sharp. So for me on that C sharp, I have to do a little bit of lip flexibility there too. Without moving my face at all, the octave C sharp is flat when I've got the lower C sharp where I want it to be. So I did have to lip up the upper C sharp just a little bit. Then I would do the exact same pitch bend exercise in that second octave, still one-handed. And when I put it together, it takes me about six minutes. Afterwards, I'd probably move on to some kind of vibrato exercise or, or something like that. Um, but I wanted to share my, my warm-up of the month with this group. Um, and it's probably going to be my warm-up of more than a month. And I have made the executive's decision in my household today to leave the air conditioner off because it's only getting up to 84 degrees. Um, and so I'm noticing my flute wants to be real sharp because it's getting pretty warm in the house um, already. Um, so thoughts on the one-handed warm-up? Shout it out, type it in. Is this something that you guys might try a little bit the next week or so? So question, if you do that, what else do you do for your warm-up? You said a little vibrato work, but what else would you do? Yeah, so in uh, lessons this month, and it's so funny because I teach so much, I don't always like practice on my own warm up stuff. But I've been starting with that one handed warm up um, for centering tone and then that lip flexibility for intonation dynamics. Um, then I move into technique because I want to take a break from tone. So I would move into my scale patterns. Then I've been coming back and doing uh, vibrato exercises. And for most of my sp students right now, I've kind of been working on speed of vibrato so having them um, work on getting the vibrato faster not that we always want fast vibrato but sometimes i like to play a little bit of vibrato on a really short note um and that requires the muscles to understand playing fast vibrato um so yeah i, I kind of go back and forth between tone and technique for a while until i feel ready for my um when i'm playing so 
Uh, I oftentimes will direct my warm up to what it have, what it is that I'm playing. If you're in the Soul of the Month group and you've seen the Demersaman uh, videos that I put on YouTube, like that's how I practice. There's not that many hours in the day, um, especially you know working a full time job and then teaching on top of that. So if I'm going to practice the air of Varier, then I would probably do a warm up dedicated to what I see as needs in the air of Varier kind of a thing. And then when I'm ready to move on to the Bach, if I'm practicing that, I might do a whole nother warm up to get ready for the Bach. Playing in A minor for a while, for sure. Um, arpeggios, the intonation and stuff around that. Um, all right. So any other thoughts around that? Or shall we move into some of our repertoire? Great, and keep this feedback coming, thank you. Um, so let's go ahead, I think I saw at least when we first logged on, the most hands waved for the Demersimon Air Varier. Um, and this is essentially in, I really think of it as in four parts. We've got the Andante, the Mim Mouvement, and then the Allegro section, there's kind of two parts of the Allegro section. Um, the bookends of it are pretty similar, and then that middle section is a little bit different. So looking at the beginning of the air Fahuye, one of the challenges that I see here is feeling light and delicate in those upward leaps. Um, and the exercise that we just did where most of the octaves happened in our mouth is really gonna help with that. So if we then go to two-handed playing and think of that same first octave that we have, the D, D. Thank you for your Then, um, and just finding the finesse of lifting the D and letting it feel light and delicate. Um, an exercise, Daniel, since Daniel knows I love warming up for the music, that I would do for this is play the D at a lighter, more delicate, and then do growing intervals to and from it. So D, C sharp, D. D, B natural, D. B flat, just because we have it in the music. A. G. F sharp. E. Octave. And when I warm up with what I'm going to be playing, yes, it probably, hopefully makes me better at whatever it is that I'm about to play, but it also just gives me the confidence that when I see the music, I don't need to stress about that because I've already practiced it today, right? And taking that stress away is one of the most beneficial things that we can do when we want to feel successful in, in music, right? Um, I might do the same thing with the high E's since there's leaps up to the high E's and those tend to be tricky notes too. So um, that would be one of the main warm-ups that I would do for this opening andante section of the Demersman is kind of those growing intervals to feel the upper register light and delicate, um, which is how I like to interpret this, um, is feeling a lift on those. I don't know if singing makes a difference on the musicians, and I'm not a great singer anyway, but the da da more, less more, less more is how I feel it. I've heard a few recordings of people doing it where the top note is very strong, and that sounds good too. I'm just kind of passing on my interpretation and how I would go about feeling comfortable doing it. So looking at this opening section, would anybody like to demonstrate or play out? Any questions or thoughts that you would like to shout out or type in? Yeah. Sorry, is this the Grand Air Varier? It is the Air Varier Opus 2, number 4. I got the wrong one. Thank you. Huh? All right, if we're feeling good about that section, I know we did it a few weeks ago. Let's talk about the Mem Mouvement. Um, similarly, um, some interval practice here. Part of that interval practice is for notes, um, but part of it is for fingers. So the finger twister for this and me, in that first move, measure of the mem and mouvement, measure 21, 
the A E A D. My fingers just don't want to play F sharp A E A D. And I don't know if it's the spring tension on the flute. Of course, my ego wants to believe it's not just my fingers can't do it. And it's hoping that like, okay, I'll be honest. I work for the best flute company in the world. And the flute that I'm playing on has never had a COA ever. So uh, don't tell my boss that. Um, <laughs> uh, so anyway, I will do a little technical exercise to kind of work around that A. So similar to the growing intervals, A, G, A, F sharp, A, F, A, E, A, D would be how I could approach it. I'm going to take the G out because that's not really necessary. So uh, just so you all know the notes I'm thinking about, let, send your eyes over to measure 37. Measure 37 has all of the intervals that are tricky for my fingers in this little chunk. And I'm going to kind of just work that as a loop. Um, in fact, I'll start just as the downbeat notes. F sharp, A, F, A, E, A, D, A. F sharp, A, F, A, E, A, D, A, et cetera. Um, so let me just show you what I mean by that. Now, this is a simple pattern. F sharp, F, E, D with an A between. So rather than think about the music as being what I need to practice, I'm going to not even look at the music, memorize those five notes that I'm playing in that pattern. So that way I can practice what's hard for me away from the music. So I disassociate hard from the music or I'm not associating hard with the music. Uh, and sometimes what I do, and I've done this since I was in school is I would get just a sheet of manuscript paper I'd write the intervals on the manuscript paper, usually without stems or rhythms, just the intervals that I needed to practice. And then I would make up 20 different rhythms to go along with that collection of notes kind of a thing. Um, so the most simple rhythm would be swing and bebop, that rhythm distortion. Bebop, reverse, short, long. But for fun, I might take those same notes and just change it. You know, like have a little fun. Your practice, my practice, doesn't need to be stagnant or boring in any way. Um, and what makes practice boring is me, right? And what pr makes practice not boring is also me and the attitude I bring to it. Um, so for me, that's the most technically challenging uh, bits in this. Um, I also recognize the measure before, measure 35, is also pretty challenging. And I could approach those in a similar way, maybe all slurred first. Um, swing. Bebop, the short long. etc. make some rhythm patterns there to make it more fun. So in this mem movement section, um, are there any questions that anybody has of like parts that are tricky or difficult that you want to talk about how to practice? I have a question. Yeah, Lisa. Uh, one, two, three. So the third bar of that section, the uh just i guess the interval the the a g to the high e without cracking the high e i lift my pinky a lot to be able mm -hmm. to get it da, 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 da. and maybe it's just position like where my air is directed but i do find that bar tricky awesome great so yes lifting your pinky does help the not awesome that you find it tricky but awesome <laughs> to bring it up <laughs> probably a lot of us find that measure tricky right yes 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 Hopefully doing the one-handed warm-up where you're focusing on the intervals being in your mouth is going to help that. Lifting your pinky is something, um, fortunately on this flute, I don't, I don't need to do that, but uh, my previous flute, I did have to lift my pinky um, on a lot of those high E's. So just don't think of it as a bad thing. Think of it as like, I'm going to make this sound good. It used to be called uh, alternate fingering. I think it's just a fingering now. I think most flute players do that often. 
Um, another thing, so with that little one-handed warm-up that we did, there's another part that I do. Um, so I'm going to take my foot joint off again. After I've done the pitch bends and the technaka, then I do uh, work to the harmonic. Right? Uh, so doing the same kind of concept that I did with the octaves, just taking it into the next uh, bit. So with that practice then, still thinking one-handed, fingering a G, and an A, so just lifting one finger, we can have a G here. We could also do the low A and G with the same one finger. And then we can put it together. And then you could see if isolating that harmonic A fingering for that high E helps you feel, right? It might help just let it be more delicate. Another thing, and I don't know if you want to play Lisa or not, but one thing I've noticed is the tendency of most humans is to, uh, the tendency of most humans is to follow the topography or the shape of the music. So I've seen a lot of people going. Right. And that just makes it really hard. And that's part of the reason that with those octave and interval practice we were doing, I was trying to go for stability of my head. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. But yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm probably moving my head a lot. <laughs> Well, you might be like one of 90% uh, of people, you know, <laughs> that is super duper common for us to, and that's, that's normal. This is actually, um, I, I taught yoga for 14 years also. And um, there was a, a, a line in my, in my training of the body follows the intention of the eyes. And so if your eyes start to look one way, your whole body starts to go that way. Right. And yeah. I don't know if you're like, Notice yourself when you're sightseeing, when driving, you start to look to the, to the right and all of a sudden you hear the rah, 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 right. So our eyes start to look down and it's normal for our body to follow. So that is something mm -hmm. that we need to create new habit, new tendencies for us to do. Acknowledge that is common, acknowledge that's natural, and then just decide that you're not going to do it. Sometimes with my students, I make them do the opposite. Uh, so I'd have them go, I'm, so, I'm sorry my sound wasn't on, but uh, so uh, let's see. I don't really want them to play like that, but sometimes in order to break a habit, I like for me to do the extreme opposite of whatever that habit was in the first place. Um, if, I'm, if I was looking down, I make myself look up. If I was shifting my weight onto my right foot, I shift my weight onto the left foot if I, uh, whatever it is. Right. So, um, I find that helpful for me, um, to become a little bit more aware of when I do have a habit and a habit is just a pattern of learning. You know, we don't need to be mad about those. Uh, we don't need to be stressed about it. We just, you know, let yourself create a new habit. Do you want to play that Lisa? Sure. I'll try playing a little bit, just those, whatever, four bars of that phrase, I guess. Perfect. All right, and um, our gallery of friends. What what did you notice? First of all, I thought that sounded great, Lisa. How did it feel to you? Good, but I feel like I cheated. Like um, that bar. I'm just not happy with how it sounds. I feel mm -hmm. like it's, um, and maybe it is, I always lift my pinky. This is a really old flute, even though it's in good prepare. But to make that E even anywhere in tune, I have to, I always have to lift the pinky. And I feel like it makes, I must be, maybe I'm lifting it for the G. In preparation. Ah. 
Yeah, so sometimes I forget to lift this finger, I think is what it is. It's not lifting fast enough. Okay, and so that might just be something to practice on its own. That harmonic yeah. practice is that G key anyway, right? Yeah. Um, so being aware that the fingers are also doing what we want them to do makes a big difference when it comes to the comfort. When you first demonstrated, and I haven't seen it since, when you first demonstrated, I did see not a big movement, but I saw just a little jerk when you went down to that A. Did you notice that? Oh, prob probably. I wasn't watching myself, though. Yeah. Yeah, I think I do. I think I, I want to go down for the A. And if you are moving down for the A, then you have to unmove down eventually, right? And that kind of extra movement also just decreases the stability of our instrument, our total instrument, right? So just be aware of when you're doing stuff that you don't need to do. Um, I don't know. That seems to be my observation for most cases in teaching is like, I feel like uh, sometimes I help people discover things that they didn't know before. But a lot of my job is to help people stop doing things that they don't need to do anymore. Um, and a lot, you know, like a lot of the stuff is like back in sixth grade, like we needed to decrease our airstream a whole lot to get a descending interval. And we needed to increase our air speed a whole lot to get the ascending interval. And we've just developed these muscles much better that we don't need to do those sixth grade things anymore or those eighth grade things or those high school things or whatever, you know? Um, so yeah. removing those layers of, um, of unnecessary stuff is also part of the job, I guess. Oh, for sure. And it helps conserve energy, which is good. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just be lazier and we'll have much more success. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, all right. So anybody else? Yes. Ellen. Let me turn on my sound here. Um, kind of along those same lines, where do you think stylistically, where do you think the eighth notes in that measure and like in 29 and 30 belong? Do they belong with the preceding, the, the figure before it or the, do they kind of lead to the figure after it? How do you, how do you interpret that? Good question. Um, do you want to demonstrate both ways or? Uh, maybe mm -hmm. I'll try like in 29. Mm -hmm. Let's see, let me sound. So it should be off for playing. original sound on on for playing. Okay. Great. Thank you, Ellen, for demonstrating. I think both sound fine. Most of this piece, to me, doesn't seem to be pickup oriented. So my personal preference, personal preference is that eighth note is a release note, um, kind of like what we had in the opening on Dante section. Some people treat those high leaps as being strong. I personally like the... Um, I like them delicate. So the similar part would hear. That is my personal take on it. Both of the ways that you demonstrated sound good, right? All right, so group out there, just a show of hands. How many people like those eighth notes as pickups? How many people prefer those eighth notes as the release notes? How many people think both sound fine? Um, so if I can just say, I think it's, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, I think the thing is to just make it simple sounding and free and easy and so maybe it doesn't matter where you do that as long as you whether you treat them as, as pickups or not as long as you have that lightness to it because mm -hmm. it's an air it's just something that like leaves in the wind yep so i'll play both ways back again and you all get to decide and we we can keep deciding over and over and every performance and every recording can be different, right? That's part of what makes being a musician like interesting. So version one.
Version two. They're both lovely. You get to choose. Uh, and Chris, uh, at the top left is where it is on mine. It says there's a big bar that says original sound for musicians colon off or on. You just tap on that to go back and forth. I don't know if that looks similar to yours, but it's on the top left for me. Any other thoughts in this meme movement section? And Daniel, can you uh, correct my pronunciation if I didn't say that right? What did you say? Meme mouvement. Men of movement. M E M E with an accent, whatever that one is. Men, yeah, Men. that's right. Men movement. Daniel is uh, in Canada and speaks French, so that's why I uh, am extra self conscious about words. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till you hear me speak English. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so what about the Allegro section? Uh, I already talked a little bit about some practice things that I do. There are, for me, the trickiest part is without contest measure 101, which is that measure that has a B flat where I have to use my one and one B flat. I learned thumb B flat in sixth grade. And anytime that I, and then I used, I learned lever B flat in seventh grade. And I, I only use the one and one B flat when I have to, and I'm really bad at it. So for me, that's just like something that's in my head and I will drill that measure. I'll play that measure just as a finger thing every single day before I go into the music. Um, that's a um, and, and those couple of measures there, swing and bebop and rhythmic distortion pattern is how I would handle it. Uh, I did have somebody ask about the fingering and measure, 37, 38 to 9, 40, measure 41, I think, the D-E-D. -E -D. Um, so real fingers work. The trill fingering would be just moving your G key. Ah, okay, hopefully you can hear me talk with the original sound on. So a real fingerings work there. but I don't like it, it feels clunky. The trill fingering for D to E is just your third finger, your G key. <laughs> to me, I don't like the pitch or the timbre of that. So what I do is real high D fingering, and then I go to an A harmonic fingering. So it's kind of like the trill fingering, but I'm putting my first finger down. That's the tone color and pitch that I prefer on that D, E, D. At least on this, uh, on the at least on this flute, um, and then for the B flat, I use the lever B flat. And there are a few people who comment on the YouTube video about uh, why would you use the lever? Well, because I'm not good at using my first finger on the F key. So if I do D E D B flat this way, that just triggers like fear in me. Um, it is not comfortable to do D E D thumb B flat because the note that precedes it is a B natural. So the nice thing about the lever is I can be lazy and just kind of already have it there. In fact, I can already be pressing the lever on the D, E, D. All right, so that's why I use the lever. Um, I, was going, I, I was going to comment on that when you were talking about the B flat. That's what I have found easier for me um, especially when we get into measure, um, when it goes to B natural to D to B flat, I find it easier to use the lever B flat. It's more comfortable for me. Yeah, all B flats, all B flats are important at some point. Um, I just, um, I, I really like those two B flat options, the thumb B flat when I can and the lever uh, almost every other time, unless I have to use my F key for some reason, like in that, that one measure uh, toward the end. Um, cause I, I, I hardly, I hardly ever use the B, B flat lever ever. <laughs> That's right. Ever lever ever. But yeah, but I find it in this piece, the B flat lever is just a lot easier. Of course, I have to be careful because I also have a C sharp trill. So if I'm not careful, I missed the B flat lever and hit the C sharp trill key. 
Yeah, there. it's worth getting familiar with all of the keys on your flute, right? Um, so maybe even make up a little bit of practice for that lever. That's me going back and forth between the F key and the lever key for that B flat. Sorry, I didn't have my sound on, but it doesn't really matter. Um, I was sounding kind of like Lizzo there for a second, just like trilling. Um, but going back and forth between the F key and the uh, lever key for the B flat, just to kind of identify where it is. Um, all of these 16th note sections can be practiced with distorted rhythms, the swing and bebop or others. Um, we already did some exercises to get ready for those large leaps. So we have E to E octaves. Um, if I hadn't done that warm up, I might do more E to E octaves. The other place that's tricky is that B sharp to F sharp interval um, for intonation. Um, so again, the target practice where I would start with the F sharp um, with the pitch where I want the F sharp to be. I like to start with the goal in mind. I forgot what note I was going to, uh, which was the B sharp. So I went a little bit past what a B sharp would be. But if I'm starting with the F sharp, getting it relaxed in my face, getting the pitch centered and the tone warm, and then I just work my way to and from that F sharp, then chances are I'm gonna have more success in the context of the Um, and yes, F, F sharp continues to be sharp for you. Some people will use the middle finger F sharp. Uh, I almost never use that, um, but it is a tool that I sometimes use. It's not, I don't not use it because I dislike it. I just don't use it because I don't need it. Um, all right, so um, I'm sorry, I wasn't looking at the chat. Yes, I'm, I forgot to turn my sound on. Cool, a harmonic. Uh, I don't know what I was doing. Oh, with which measure? Uh, let's see. Measure 66, 65, measure 64 has a B sharp to F sharp leap in it. Um, but there's quite a lot of F sharps in this. So doing rowing intervals to and from the F sharp mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense to do. Um, there's a lot of F sharps here. And that, like C sharp, is a note that we flute players like to avoid practicing. And I'm one of those people who like, I try to practice C sharp and F sharp, high F sharp and high E more than I practice any other note because I don't want to be afraid of three little notes on the flute, right? Um, I need somebody to remind me to do that with my low C though, because I don't practice that enough. Um, so in this part, the Allegro section of the Demersimon, any other thoughts or questions or concerns or anybody want to play something out or talk about anything? Okie dokie. All right, let's move on to our friend, the Bach Partita then. Um, and I went ahead and pulled out like my actual music because the version I downloaded um, had misprints and I was just too lazy to go and, and correct those misprints. Um, the Sarabande, the, this version does not have the um, repeat of the opening four measures, but I do, I do repeat the opening four measures. I know there's some people who do and some people who don't. I think it makes a whole lot of sense uh, after measure 28 to go back and play measures one, two, three, and four again, and then 29. Um, I don't know if it makes sense because that's what I've always done and that's what my teachers told me to do or what, but like it's ingrained in me as that's that's right. Um, so that is one thing I do in this. Um, I have played Bach and played completely no vibrato and I have played Bach and I've used romantic vibrato and I play Bach and I, these days I tend to be somewhere in between. So uh, I'm sorry, I haven't been following along with uh, the group's practice too much. Has there been any discussion on to vibrate or not to vibrate in this piece? Or what are your thoughts if there hasn't yet been discussion? You know, I've been following along loosely on, on that group's posts. It's fun to see everyone posting, especially Sarah Bond. But 
Um, it doesn't look like there's been much discussion of vibrato or not. And I know I personally historically play it, you know, singing out and lots of vibrato. So that's my traditional trends, you know, my traditional way of playing it. And then I've been experimenting with, um, you know, the more 20th century style. Yeah. Do you have your flute out? Could you show us a couple of ways that you might approach it? Yeah. Let me go get it. Hold on a sec. You've uh, migrated to the kitchen, it seems. I have. There's supposedly better Wi-Fi in here. So oh, probably maybe it'll ring a little better, too. I'll be right back. Sure thing. Um, well, Sean's getting his flute. Um, any other thoughts on this or anybody else been exploring with to vibrate or not to vibrate or how and when to vibrate? Yeah, Daniel, what are your thoughts? Uh, you're on mute still. Uh, my thoughts aren't very clear. <laughs> and so I'm glad you're talking about it. I, I, I tend to think I shouldn't be vibrating very much in this at all. And um, when I've been playing it, I suppose what I've been doing is using the vibrato on the longer notes to just give them energy. But I try to do this with as little as possible. I get a little, as I've told you before, I feel like I get a little overwrought. And so I try um, to pull back on the use of the vibrato, you know, um, in the climaxing of this piece, the the few places where I felt um, like at bar 31 and 30, 30, from 30 to 33 is a place where I would naturally vibrate a lot. And I try to pull back on that, but I might be wrong or I might just be, I don't know. I suppose I like to hear the sound of a broke flute and I don't consider that very vibrating. Yeah, well, the metal flute doesn't sound that much like a broke flute either. So that is sometimes what uh, flute players will argue. Um, but my book, uh, one of my teachers, Don Gottlieb, he was the piccolo player of the Louisville Orchestra for his career. Um, he told me lots of things, but one nugget that stuck is there are more right ways to do things than wrong. Um, so if it feels right to you and no one's getting hurt, then like, let yourself enjoy it. All right, well, Sean, I, it looks like you're back I with guess, this loop. Oh, go. Just, just, I just add, just, I feel like this piece can take you away and you can get, or at least for me, I can get um, a little overwrought and emotional with it. And I feel like when I do that, I vibrate more. And so I'm trying these days to be less that way. All right, I'll show you what I... Okay, first I'll do the way I was taught and the way I traditionally play this. what I call the uh, 20th century approach. Can you hear me? Is the original sound working? Excellent. Okay, so then the, the more 21st century approach would say
I mean, well, Sean, you make everything sound good. So, um, yes, there's actually, there's, in addition to vibrato, that's, you You demonstrated the other thing I wanted to talk about when talking about Bach 2, uh, which we'll get to in a second. But from the group, what were your thoughts on the 20, his 20th century, um, which was, had more vibrato. It was a slower vibrato, more subtle. Um, and then the 21st century, which is people, too many people getting doctorates in music and just reading lots of old books and treatises as part of it, right? Like, and then trying to play without vibrato uh, less. Um, so what is the, the thought of it? The both second version said it's less legato. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both were beautiful, Sean. But my, my heart really liked the first one. <laughs> Much more. And I think probably that's just because you hear, or at least over the years, you hear more of the first than you do the second, for me at least. And so my heart loved, really loved the first one, but they were both beautiful. I think if I had a um, traverso, I might do more of the second one. <clears throat> I just don't think that style comes off as well on a metal flute. Yeah, I do have a traverso and it just sits on my piano. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's just on the piano that I don't play. My gosh, I don't even know why I have them. I should just stick with my flute, right? Um, Wait a minute. So I have a question that, because I've really never heard 21st century interpretations, nor is the 20th century interpretation that you played, and the sound is incredible, incredible. Um, so hats off. Uh, is the sound, uh, sorry, is the 20th century what you would call a traditional interpretation? It's what I see as traditional because I grew up in that era, listening to, you know, Galway and Ram Paul and you know, the people of that generation performing it with the approaches that they brought out of the, you know, the Paris Conservatory teachings. And the professor that I studied with was also a premier pre-graduate of Paris Conservatory. So it's very much in that line of thinking. But if you, um, you know, there was a late to like 1980s, 1990s, the hip movement started taking off mostly around, you know, New York and Boston. And that approach is let's study all the old treatises and let's make some reproductions of the instruments they used to have and figure out what it would have sounded like back then. So the 21st century is more of a recreation of, you know, based on the evidence that we can find, what do we think the players would have done back in the day? Yeah, based on reading the treatises, um, I, obviously there's no sound recordings, but there's uh, not much mention of vibrato in, in flute nor vocal technique. There's mention of technique of flottement where they would have um, like wiggled their finger on some open keys to create some pitch fluctuation, but those were usually on longer notes to create a little bit of stimulation. Um, I'm not sure whole on those things is really small. So it would be kind of like doing vibrato on a piccolo. Yeah, yeah. Um, so good. I think both ways sound appropriate, and I'm glad that we talked about it. When, if I were to use the vibrato on this, I would probably use less, and I would probably use it on some of the longer notes, um, or some of the notes that are significant to harmonic change. And I like uh, Sean's approach of using a subtle vibrato. Uh, I teach, um, like when I do guest workshops, one of my workshops is called the Vibrato Box. And I think of vibrato as not just being on or off, but by having dimension and three dimension. The uh, two that are easiest to find are speed and size. So without changing my uh, dynamic, I could... Original sound. Sound is off. Yes. So that's the speed of vibrato. The size, I'm gonna just do triplets. And then everything between. So those are the two easiest to access dimensions of what I call the vibrato box, this cube. And we can fill in that entire cube to find what it is that we, what is going to be most appropriate for what it is that we're going to look for. So if you're not used to doing a smaller or slower vibrato like Sean demonstrated, 
It says the vibrato of the waves were pretty small and the waves were more spread apart or a slower vibrato. That is something to practice as part of your warm up as well. Um, is just working on the size and speed of vibrato. Uh, the third part, in case you're curious, is shape, so we can have a rounder vibrato or a more pointed vibrato. I think that's more uh, useful for me when I was performing a lot of really modern music, where sometimes I needed to sound aggressive or sweet or in between, so that's more of that character nuance. Um, so those are the three parts of vibrato that I practice, so that way I, when I apply it to music, I have a bit more control um, over the expression of the music. The other thing that Sean demonstrated that I do want to talk about, because it applies to all Bach and stuff, is articulation. You may have noticed his 20th century interpretation was mostly slurred um, with the vibrato, and then his 21st century was mostly articulated. I have slurs marked in my music by pencil, like my music has no articulations. I do have slurs written in, but now I look at those as phrase shapes. I worked with a Baroque cellist in grad school, um, and he said, well, you can't slur all that because my bow is only this long and I have to change my bow and it will sound weird if you're slurring and I'm doing bow movements. So because I was performing with a cellist who had a shorter than normal bow, um, I was encouraged to do that. I'll still slur, do some slur two things if I want to emphasize a note or maybe, slur, you know, I'll occasionally add a slur in slur a neighbor tone or something, if there's like an A, G sharp, A, there, there are times that I slur, but my overall articulation is tongued. However, that's the other thing where we can practice a little bit of variation. So we can have tonguing going from right? It can be a very legato tongue to help that shape. I like to think of different um, words, do da 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 di da 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 do da 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 di da da da. And I don't just use that in Baroque playing where I have the more legato. Um, I use it in all things. Um, if if the articulated part needs dynamic emphasis, I might do a more legato tongue if I want to sound louder because there's more sound, or a less legato tongue if I want to sound a little bit softer because then there's a little bit more space or silence. So I do that a whole lot in, in is, Mushi, I've forgotten its, his name. Um, so I use the articulation size quite a lot. How many of you have explored different articulations in um, this Bach piece? A couple of you? Um, great, so let's look at, let's just try this together. Let's look at measure 10. And rhythmically, I believe it should be chord note tied to eighth note, followed by six sixteenth notes in measure 10. Um, that's not what's printed in my part, but that's what I play. Let's try it where we do it almost entirely slurred, which will be... Go ahead and take a second and try it. Mostly slurred. And let's try it now, mostly tongued. Sorry.
while everyone's playing that, I just want to mention, um, don't forget this is a dance. All right, now that you've tried, now that you've tried it slurred and tongue, what are some thoughts that you have between the two? Well, uh, of course, I've always got something to say. Um, I'm keeping in mind that the last movement, that the last movement is uh, fairly quick and uh, jumpy, and that the first movement I play mostly articulated. So I'm looking at it in context um, as something that even though I don't mind the sound of it um, articulated, I think it's nice to have some time to breathe and to let it be more smooth. Um, so that's my thought. Good. What else? I think for me, if I was going to <clears throat> practice it articulated, I would definitely need to work on a softer, more gentle. Um, I don't like the way it sounds the way I'm doing it right now, but it's because I think it's too, my articulation is too separated almost. What, like it's too, what consonant and vowel are you thinking right now? I'm thinking do, I, but I don't think I'm uh, as successful as I want to be. Mm -hmm. Good. Maybe change the shape of your vowel with the D or sometimes I think new, like N-U. The tongue is then higher on the ridge and further from the teeth, and it just is less aggressive for me. Um, okay. And this, yes, uh, Sean is right. This is a this is a dance. We need to remember that the sarbande is a Spanish dance, I think, um, a stately dance uh, that's usually pretty slow and stately, uh, which is good contrast to the bore that follows, which is going to have a lot more upward lift. The articulation, there's a lot of ways we can approach this. In Bach in general, because of my work with that Baroque cellist guy, usually I look at the shortest notes that we see commonly. So in the Bore, the shortest notes are 16th notes. If I tongue them, I would tongue the shortest note values legato. And then the next note value up, which would be eighth notes, I put more space or more lift. Then the next note value up, which would be quarter notes, I would do more legato. The next value up, half notes, I would put more space between them. So it was just kind of that looking for the smallest thing, legato, the next smallest thing, less legato, the next thing, legato again, kind of a thing. Um, I do a lot of slurs in the bore, even though I said I tongued most Bach, but like these little slur twos, a Baroque cellist can definitely slur two. Like their bow is long enough to slur two notes together. So I do a lot of two note slurs in this. Um, in that third measure, I'll probably slur the three neighbor tones, the E, F, E, E, F, E, E, F, E. I would probably personally slur those, but there's a lot of ways of interpreting this. Uh, we've gone past on time, which I'm notorious to do. Um, so does anybody just have anybody, anything that they would like to talk about or play or ask since we've got a great group of people here today? We didn't even make it to ornamentation. I I know. Um, and thank you for trilling from above on those trills. I thought that sounded really nice um, on the trills that you gave us. You added the Apache Torah before them. Um, but no, we didn't make it to our ornamentation today. Although we've talked Bach in the past. We've we've done, I think, both JS and CPE Bach pieces between the true two groups. So let's go back and listen to some of those old discussions that we've had. Any other thoughts or questions about what we've covered? All right. Well, in that case, I'll let you all have your day back. The weather is beautiful here in Belleville, Illinois. It's 84 degrees and sunny, which means it's 80 degrees in my house right now. So sorry about my little glisten. Um, you all are fabulous. I appreciate the time we get to spend together in our virtual groups and in these meetings. And um, does anybody remember what the piece is for next month? Is it the Reineke Balad? Is that right? Reineke Balad. Scarier looking piece. We don't have to do all of it. We can do what we want. We don't have to play at the printed tempos. I'll try to put some recordings up of the Reineke Ballad, not at the printed tempo. So that way you don't just have the scary tempos in your ears, right? Like music is meant to be played, not feared. Let's do it. And we've still got plenty of July left. So I'll look forward to hearing more and more of this Demersamon and the Bach 
And I'll try to spend a little bit more time listening in the second group because I do love the partita so much. Uh, thank you everybody who uh, okay. shouted out, Ellen for your feedback, Lisa for your playing, Sean and Daniel and everybody else for being here. I'll see y'all next time. Oh, and thank you Flute World. <laughs>